Hello again, 240. I misspoke at the end of part one, Triumph of the Swoosh. This is part two. And as mentioned, the health trainer and certified health instructor of the 1970s, that new trend, reflected the pioneering work of three physical culturists who preached much the same message, but clearly were ahead of their time. And this image has been allowed for me to use by Mr. Jim Bennett. This is from his website, Bennett at BennardMcFadden.com. And the title of his book is Muscle, Sex, Money, and Fame, The Incredible True Story of a Man and His Obsessions. And this is Bernard McFadden, one of these pioneers of the physical culture or physical fitness culture that we know of today. He's 65 years old in this picture, again, in this image. I have permission to use it from Mr. Jim Bennett, Bennett at BernardMcFadden.com. It's worth a look. Born in rural Missouri in 1868, Bernard McFadden willed himself to survive a sickly childhood by following a regimen of physical exercise and a diet heavy in fruits, nuts, and vegetables. By the turn of the century, weightlifting had transformed his scrawny, five foot six inch frame into a block of rippling muscles as we saw. McFadden launched a publicity campaign to sell his lifestyle to the American people, establishing various institutes and fitness camps. Not hesitant to promote himself and his message of physical culture, McFadden was part health educator and part carnival huckster. By the 1920s, his personal fortune derived largely from his publications, lectures, and a chain of health atoriums that offered classes and special spa treatments, this is early 20th century, ladies and gentlemen, was estimated at $20 million. But as he aged, McFadden engaged in increasingly bizarre behaviors. His public advocacy of the joys of sex and his publications that featured men and women scantily attired to facilitate strenuous physical activity both titillated and alienated readers. His repeated renunciations of the medical profession amounted to nothing more than ignorance compounded by stubbornness. This one-time fitness advisor to presidents died in 1955 at the advanced age of 87, but not before he attracted national attention at the age of 81 by safely parachuting from an airplane. Ah, shades of George Herbert Walker Bush. His first of two such publicity-seeking plunges. That's not... Mr. George Herbert Walker Bush. Beset by increasing criticisms of his personal life and public behavior, McFadden lost his public relations edge during the 1920s to bodybuilder Angelo Siciliano, a modest man whose imposing physique appeared with regularity in the popular media. Born in Italy in 1892, Siciliano emigrated to the United States as a child. He was, according to his own narrative, a 97-pound weakling who once was humiliated while with a female friend on a Long Island beach when a husky lifeguard kicked sand in his face. He thereupon became obsessed with bodybuilding, eventually creating his own workout program that relied upon simple isometric exercises without the use of weights. He won Bernard McFadden's World's Most Beautiful Man contest in 1920 and became a favorite model for photographers and sculptors, taking the name of Charles Atlas. He packaged his unique muscle building system into a mail order course, and for $29.95 for the complete set of 12 lessons, and he sold millions of copies by promoting them in comic books, as we'll see in a moment, and magazine, magazine advertisements depicting his own body development from that of embarrassed skinny kid on the beach to the world's most perfect male specimen. And there's an example of how Atlas created his fitness empire, and all he had to do was mail that in for $29.95. What a man! Only 15 minutes a day. Atlas urged a healthy lifestyle free from alcohol. He'd celebrate personal triumphs with a glass of carrot juice, and when asked, told strangers that the secret to a healthy life was live clean, think clean, and don't go to burlesque shows. 
He continued his daily exercise program into old age, 50 knee bends, 100 sit-ups, and 300 push-ups, and distance running on a Florida beach. And he appeared in magazine photographs in his 70s, his muscles still rippling and his impressive physique unchanged. Atlas died of cardiac arrest, ironically enough, after a long run at the age of 79 in 1972, just as the national fitness craze was captivating the American public. In 1936, a young bodybuilder by the name of Jack Lane opened one of the nation's first health clubs in Oakland, California, and in 1951 began a 33-year stint on daytime television demonstrating exercises and urging his viewers to join in his workout routines and, of course, to purchase his assorted exercise equipment and his famous power juicer. And there's a picture from early television of Mr. Jack LaLanne from beanbeachgirl.wordpress. And it's from the day that LaLanne actually passed away in 2011. He invented exercise machines that utilize pulleys and adjustable weights. And his health clubs expanded to a chain of 200. LaLanne claimed he was the first physical fitness expert who encouraged women to lift weights as a regular component of their exercise program. And he devoted his life to promoting good health through vigorous exercise and a vegetarian diet that included some fish. In 2010, at the age of 96, still deriving much of his daily nutrition from the fruit and egg white concoctions he squished in his personal power juicer, Lelaine was still lifting weights and doing exercises two hours each morning before spending another hour swimming laps. He died of respiratory failure brought on by pneumonia on January 23, 2011. That McFadden, Atlas, and Lelaine live long, healthy lives gave credence to their basic message of proper diet and vigorous exercise. Those messages, tweaked and modified, would be advanced by an army of health advocates during the latter years of the 20th century. All three of these early fitness crusaders walked a well-traveled American entrepreneurial highway as the fitness craze swept the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. Old line athletic apparel and equipment companies attempted to respond to the burgeoning new market, but they faced a wave of new competition. Companies armed with alluring new products and compelling advertising strategies entered the fray, and the company that proved to be the most agile and adept at setting the standard for the new fitness age began in the Oregon College town of Eugene during the 1960s. And we will conclude in part three with Triumph of the Swoosh.